The Rust Center for Media in downtown Cape Girardeau, welcome to Focus on Southeast, a program on issues and events impacting the campus of Southeast Missouri State University. I'm Dan Woods with KRCU Public Radio. Southeast Missouri State University is now offering a Bachelor of Science in Agribusiness that combines horticulture and cannabis. The degree option is brand new and CMO is one of the few institutions and perhaps the only school that offers it. Students who complete the degree will be familiar with agribusiness, horticulture and cannabis and the chemistry side of the plant. Dr. Sven Svensson is professor of agriculture here at Southeast and he's here to tell us more about it. Sven, good to see you. Hi, good to see you, how are you? Good. So um, tell us about this new degree, uh, what, what does it entail and how did it come to be? Well, again, it started back in 2014 when the government first gave the university's permission to start researching hemp um, as a crop for farmers in the United States. Prior to that, it essentially had been restricted since the 1930s. So with permission to start looking at that, that's when I started thinking about if this is an emerging, emerging crop and an emerging economy uh, for the country, we're going to have to get our students ready to service that. So that's when we started looking at it. The objective then was to find what aspects of that industry can we support and can we develop. So we started mixing the concepts of it's a plant, it's a crop, we're farmers, we kind of know to do how to do that part mm -hmm. of that. But it's unique in that what the plant gets used for is so diverse. Uh, you can move from uh, bioplastics to making airplanes to making automobiles to making food that people can eat to making clothes that what folks can wear to uh, repairing soil that has been damaged by human activity um, all of those things all from all from the same plant so how do you how do you create a major that yeah. can go in so many different directions and so we put we wanted to put an emphasis on the basic root knowledge skills that would be necessary so that they can be successful in any direction they choose to take that Mm -hmm. So that's where we went back to the basic agribusiness, which is our core, understanding the, the agribusiness side of it, um, add the horticulture side to it since it's a horticultural crop, and then the piece that needs to be added on top of that is the chemistry. So much of what the plant gets used for involves chemical reactions, chemical analysis, and chemical changes. So they okay. need to have a, an understanding, if not uh, a full knowledge of how those things work. So we married our existing agribusiness horticulture program to what is essentially a chemistry minor, um, putting the two together into a brand new major, giving the students the business skills, the horticulture skills, the chemistry skills, um, and the ecological skills to be successful in the emerging new economy of hemp. So what, what do what a job prospect look like? I mean, I would, this is a growing uh, field, as you said. What are prospects? for like students that get this degree? Oh, well, right, uh, the, the other thing that drove me to start this was because about half of the horticulture majors that were graduating, that's the industry that was picking them up. So right. half, half the students in agribusiness horticulture were already being employed in that industry. And one of the reasons they were going that way is because the pay scale was so good. Um, and uh, the need on an emerging industry like that for skill sets that can help the businesses be successful and help the, um, the processors of the product be successful was so high and still remains high um, that they can they can continue to look for uh, good good paying jobs from any direction whether it's just business management side whether it's the uh, the plant growing horticultural side or whether it deals with the chemistry side of now that we have the products what does the what what does the industry see um, as the uh, demand out there for the products that are made from uh, the hemp plants. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're looking at all of those different directions and it's really kind of hard to navigate exactly which way to tell them to go. Yeah. So again, we fall back to give them the basic skills they need so that they can choose which direction they want to go. Now when people hear cannabis, they think, okay, that's THC, there's marijuana involved. How, okay, yeah. what so is the, what's the let's legality? Let's get that definition yeah, straight. So um, just as an analogy, you're used to say cabbage. Uh, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, mm -hmm. and everybody thinks of those as different things. In fact, they are in fact the same plant species. They're the same thing. They just are, are manipulated different for different uses. Um, we have a plant called cannabis sativa. It is one plant, but then there's th the thing we call marijuana, and then there's the thing we call hemp. Um, legally, the definition between those two right now has to deal with the THC content, which is 0.3% THC. 
If it has more than 0.3% THC in it, it is by definition marijuana. That's still illegal. Um, and you know there are states where they have legalized that, but federally it's still illegal as well. So there's ambiguity even still right. in the law. Um, with what uh, we're allowed to teach and with what we proposed here at Southeast Missouri State University was to deal with hemp, those plants of cannabis sativa that do not have 0.3% THC or more in them, they have 0.3% or less. Some of them have none at all, and that would be the target for that industry. Um, because if they accidentally slip above that percentage, then they become an illegal crop and the crop has to be destroyed. So the trick would be to develop hemp varieties that allow us to develop all of these different products without having any fear of it being ever, ever being an illegal crop. So for a farmer to want to grow hemp, if for some reason that THC level rises in their crop, mm -hmm. they have to just buy it. By the rules and regulations we are growing under right now, if it exceeds 0.3% THC, the crop has to be destroyed at the farmer's expense. And that would put some hesitancy on their part yes, to think, oh, do we want to do this or not? Yes. There, it is, you know, farming is a risky business as it is. It's kind of like right. gambling. You don't know what, the, what Mother Nature is going to serve up for a weather pattern and those sorts of things. Um, now you've added on top of that, if I've got a variety and for some reason that variety becomes, it contains more than 0.3% THC in the way I grew it, now I've lost my crop and all of the investment that I put into it, I've lost that as well. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the uses of hemp because there are so many uses that I had looked through last time you I talked about this. So kind of go yeah. through some of the things that you may be surprised so to know. Our best guess is about 50,000. 50,000 things 50, that we found 000. that we can do with it. So. Um, the, the seed grain from the crop is edible. It contains um, omega fatty acids in it that a lot of vegetarian vegan diets don't have. Um, okay. So it contains uh, a, a, a full blend of the, of the um, amino acids that you need in your diet. It contributes to that, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking at food crops, there's ways to use that. We can extract the oil from the seeds, use that either from cooking oil or for industrial oils for lubricants. Um, we can um, look at the other flower uses. So besides the THC cannabinoid that's in that plant, there are hundreds of other cannabinoids in there that have medical applications. The one that most people are emphasizing right now is CBD, uh, mm. uh, okay. cannabidiol. And that one gets used for, um, besides just general re other things, but it's often used for painkillers. Okay. Um, people that are undergoing things like uh, chemotherapy for cancer. Um, they might lose their appetite and they might be suffering a lot of pain and there's a lot of different ways they've been treated for those symptoms. Um, this, the, the cannabinoids that are available that are not THC can help them get through that process and improve, improve mm -hmm. their treatments. Uh, so that's the medical side. Then there's the industrial side of this. Um, the, e the phrase we like to, to reproduce quick, quickly to remind everybody is that pretty much anything made out of plastic can be made out of hemp. So if you think of all of the plastic things we have and the fact that when those are no longer useful, it, it just becomes landfill, plastic pollution, maybe it's part of plastics floating around in huge ocean collections and those right. sorts of things. All that plastic could be made out of biodegradable hemp. And so instead of being phthalate esters floating around as little particles in the air, um, it would instead just decompose naturally in the environment because it's made from a natural product. So think about everything from a sandwich bag to a grocery bag, to, um, you know, I don't know, just a, a plastic casing on a television, anything like that. Um, when it's done and it's no longer serving its use, where does it go? Um, if it's made out of hemp, it will just simply decompose. Um, so mm -hmm. anything made out of plastic can be made out of hemp. It's a bioplastic. We make bioplastics already out of things like soybean and other things, but it doesn't work as easy as it does with hemp. And it so, can be a fuel too, right? Yes, you told me. yes, and so, yeah. Uh, Henry Ford made a car out of hemp in 1942. Um, that included the fuel to operate the car. So they knew that technology and how to use it back in 1942, apply modern skills to that same idea. We could do it far better. There's a company in Canada that just recently made an airplane out of hemp. And the test, the strength test on the, the fuselage of the, of the plane is stronger than one made out of metal. And so the plane weighs less so that it takes less fuel to fly it from point to point, and like you mentioned, it can fly on its own fuel. And there's hempcrete too, which is another interesting... It, hempcrete is fascinating. The, the federal government just approved the use of hempcrete in building buildings. 
So that's, a, a, that's an up and coming thing. So you're using the herd, which is the, the center pith portion of the stems of the plant. And they're using that in a manner in which they otherwise make uh, Portland cement and concrete mm -hmm. and things like that. So you're putting a, 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 re, a biological carbon-based element into the concrete that's otherwise used to build the buildings. So now every building, as it's being built, becomes a carbon sequestration process, sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere. So if you're dealing with issues like uh, climate change, global warming, those sorts of things, and you're looking for ways of balancing the atmospheric carbon, um, and taking some of that carbon out of the atmosphere, the way we build our buildings, if we're using hempcrete, does that. So you can get to a situation where a, car, uh, a building is built carbon negative, not just carbon neutral or sustainable, it's carbon negative. It's helping to sequester carbon back from the atmosphere and put it back into it's a non-atmospheric yeah. condition. It's locked in that it's block, in. right? Mm -hmm. And it's fireproof or very resistant yeah, the, to fire. Yeah, the neatest thing about hemp, when they use it as an insulating factor, when, they, when they've made it into the, um, the hempcrete and the hemp insulation, they can hold a, an incinerator burner right next to the material and it will not uh, propagate the flame. It'll glow red, it'll get hot, but it will not propagate the flame. So the buildings made out of hempcrete are essentially fire resistant, burn resistant. So in 1942, Henry Ford built a car out of hemp. I know Levi's used to be made, or at least partially out yes. of him, jeans. So why is it so, what, what happened that we didn't ever get to the point where it's more used than so now? now? Now this is a question where I have to be more careful answering this. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, it's, I guess the easiest way to say it is describe it as politics, but it's business and politics. Mm. It's the mixture of business and politics. Um, there's a business that has a, a set market. They don't want to lose their business. So they will lobby to make sure that their business is protected and a competitive industry does not come in. Okay. Uh, perhaps one of the easiest things to use as an analogy might be the difference between computers and typewriters. Uh, with the onset of word processors and computers, a typewriter was essentially rendered irrelevant. Um, now sometimes they still have uses but, right. and they're still around, but they're, right. they're essentially an antique that doesn't have much use now. Right. Um, hemp has the ability to disrupt technologies that way. Um, if I currently make concrete blocks, I don't like the idea of hempcrete no. um, because it's a competitive product that has an additional value that my product cannot offer. Um, so if I was in the 1930s and I was inventing things like nylon and various plastics made out of petroleum oil and that was my investment, and then somebody's coming along and showing that they can make the same thing out of a renewable, sustainable plant, um, instead of using it from oil that's been pumped from the ground, I've got uh, two competitive uh, mm -hmm. industries right. trying to compete for the same market. There's going to be some politics over that. Yeah. I would say the folks like Henry Ford and others that were developing the hemp market at the time, they lost that political fight at that time. It's only yeah. just now where we're kind of having that fight again yeah. and doing it again. So what does the future look like for hemp? Um, I think it's good just sim simply because some of the other things that have developed over time, like the issue of climate change and global warming, becoming aware of that and that we need to manage the carbon that's in the atmosphere. Um, hemp is one of those products that is sh shovel ready. It's a shovel ready fix to this particular mm -hmm. issue. Um, and it deals, you know, we're, you're dealing with the idea of we don't have to worry about conserving and uh, polluting less. We can actually start taking the pollution out of the atmosphere. And, and the plant is wonderful for doing that sort of things. It's a, the plant is what we call a phytoaccumulator. Um, plant, uh, cannabis plants absorb everything that's in their environment. So if there's an air pollutant, it's gonna absorb it. If there's a pollutant in the soil, it's gonna absorb it. And that has a cautionary note to folks that otherwise like to smoke that, pro that plant. They might wanna think about that. Yeah. Because they're getting far more than just the cannabinoids and whatever else is in the plant. They're also getting everything that was in the environment while that plant was being grown. Oh. And so make sure that that's safe. Well, we can use the plant to clean the environment up because of that. If we have okay. airborne pollutants, the cannabis can help us clean the air. If we have soil-borne pollutants, the cannabis can help us clean the soil. And then if we use those products and put it into something like hempcrete, all of those, those items that are there are diluted down to where they're not dangerous and they're locked away in a location where they're safe and mm -hmm. cannot cause harm. Before we go, I wanna ask you about, this is a constantly changing field and so as you teach the class, you have to constantly change things, right? Yeah, okay, I'm in, I'm in year three of teaching this class and it's quite different than year one. 
And I've already, some of the students from the first year have sat through a class or two in year three, and they're just like, man, I want to take that class again. Uh, because it has changed and it is so different. That's perhaps the, the most difficult thing about teaching it, is you never know what new item is going to come out and what new thing is going to take place. Um, mm -hmm. And um, you let uh, you know, a billion minds apply their creative skills to a new technology. Uh, brand new things could be invented, brand new things and new solutions could be found that nobody's even thought of yet. Yeah. Uh, because we haven't been able to, it's not been legal. Now it's becoming legal and so people are now taking the time to think about opportunities that they've never had before. And the politics of it could change over time, which would change the way it's viewed mm -hmm. later on down the line. It could open up opportunities for some of the things that you kind of yes. talked about. Hopefully. All right. Dr. Finn Svensson, always good to talk with you. Thanks yeah, for thank visiting you. with us. Yeah, enjoyed it. All right, when we come back, we're going to look to the night sky and find out all there is to know about a new telescope recently acquired by the Department of Chemistry and Physics with Dr. Jonathan Kessler. You're watching Focus on Southeast. We will be right back. Every day, millions of people are connecting. Father. Cosplayer. Mentor. Actor. It's time we take a step forward, come together, and discover how accepting our differences can make, make us stronger. Southeast Missouri. Let's try this again. You are Southeast Missouri. You make Southeast Missouri what it is. And Southeast Missouri is who we are. It's in our name. It's in our past. And with you, it's our future. Welcome home. Welcome back to Focus on Southeast. Southeast Department of Chemistry and Physics purchased a new telescope this summer that will help provide a great view of the night sky. Dr. Jonathan Kessler is here. He's gonna tell us all about it. Yeah. Hey there, good to see you. Good to see you too, Dan. Um, and uh, we, we recently uh, purchased this uh, Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. Um, and uh, it's, it's not necessarily a new piece of technology mm -hmm. because uh, CIMO has actually had in some form or fashion, uh, some type of astronomical observatory, um, dating back decades, I think, wow, at this cool. point. Um, you know, at one point we had a really wonderful uh, three telescope observatory out at, uh, um, on Old McKendry Road, if you're kind of out by Buckites in Jackson. Okay. We used to have the demonstration farm, and, uh, you know, ag was really accommodating, and we had a couple yeah. sheds out there. And um, years passed, we sold the farm. Right. Um, back in, I think, 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. And we were fortunate enough in 2017 to get an internal grant to fund a mobile or portable observatory. Okay. And so we have a trailer and we rigged up our, at the time, our 14-inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope okay. to be on a wheel. We can roll it out, drive it places where there's dark sky and sort of bring the observatory to other people. Yeah. And so this last, uh, last couple of years, we had an internal proposal funded to buy and upgrade our observatory, and we purchased this new 16-inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. So, how does this new one compare to the, pre the one you already had? You know, so it's a 14-inch to a 16-inch. It's an upgrade. We were running into some issues with aging with the old one, mm -hmm. um, but I will say that the um, the the view and the quality is essentially proportional to uh, the area of the telescope. So, okay. if you look at the front, sort of light collecting part of the telescope, you're going to get about a percentage increase in quality of your image proportional to the size of that, that telescope. Okay. So 14 to 16 might sound like a small bump, the area is the diameter squared or the radius squared, and so we end up with, instead of just a small bump in quality, maybe about a 15 to 25 percent bump in quality with just two inches of added uh, diameter. Yeah, yeah. And there's an astronomy club on campus too, and I guess this, they, they benefit from this as well, right? Yeah, so we have a really strong astronomy club on campus. The advisor is uh, Professor Pamela Mills, who's okay. been working for the, for the Department of Chemistry and Physics uh, for a while. 
Um, and they have, uh, last time I was at a meeting, I think there might have been 25 to 45 people. That's there was, good. we were in an auditorium, there's a lot of people. Um, uh, so there's been really good uh, collaboration. Fortunately, because of them, we've been able to collaborate with them and we set up events. They're sort of periodic because the weather is always very important yes. when you're going to use a telescope. Absolutely. So we will uh, set up an event usually a week in advance, uh, sort of prepare and keep an eye on the cloud cover mm -hmm. and the weather. And if everything looks good, usually a few days in advance, we'll sort of put the call out on our you know department Facebook page and um, and try to let people know that we're going to do a sort of a pop-up sky viewing. Um, with the the current observatory is currently located and parked uh, between Rhodes Hall and uh, the, the Seaball Polytechnic building in that back parking lot. Oh. Okay. And so we can just open that up, roll that out. We bring the 16 inch um, out from the building, set them up in the parking lot, and we do sort of an impromptu sky viewing right there. Because I remember, I think I read that the, it's, a, it's 300 pounds. I mean, it's, it's a thing to lug around, right? It is very big. The 14 inch is much lighter. It's on a wheelie bar. It's got wheels. We just roll it right out yeah. of the trailer. The 16 inch, the, the, uh, the OPT, sort of the top part of the telescope with the lens and everything mm -hmm. and the mirrors, um, is around, I think 150 to 200 pounds, and then the, the tripod that we set it up, the field wow. tripod weighs about 75 to 80 pounds. Wow, what have the, what's the student response been to this new telescope? You know, um, we bring this thing out, and we get a lot of students that show up because they heard about it or whatever. We get yeah. a lot of students that just walk by and they're like, what is this? And um, honestly, the last time we did an event, I think we had 60, 70 people show up. And the first event we did this year, we had almost 150 people show up. And wow. it's, it's, I mean, to be able to uh, just walk up and put your eye in a telescope mm -hmm. and see the rings of Saturn um, for the first time by eye, or to see the moons around Jupiter and actually be able to see the, the storm clouds or the, the, um, the storm spot on Jupiter with your yeah. own eyes is really, I think, um, Kind of, kind of inspiring for some students. Kind of, a little bit of uh, awe-inspiring. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, is there something that that has been viewed that you're like, wow, I can't believe this is amazing. What's jumped out at you? S Saturn is definitely a, like a, I think, a showstopper. Um, seeing Saturn and seeing the rings and that tilt is like, you know, honestly, for me, I think back to the original Star Trek. Um, when you kind of see that intro scenes, like oh, I, yeah. I think they probably use like actual images of planets and stuff in some of that because it just has that sort of nostalgic sort of feel to seeing it with your own eyes. Um, it, in addition, I think last December and maybe in January, we got a really good look at the Orion Nebula, which is one of the brighter nebulas oh. in the sky. And um, it's a beautiful blue color and with a lot of with a lot of uh, images that you see, a lot of those are taken with a black and white camera and then they get sort of false colored or recolored. Okay. So to be able to actually see this with your own eye, and that's one of the advantages of the telescope that we purchased, the Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope is, I think, it's, it's not a photographer's instrument necessarily. Okay. It's really optimized to be able to get really clear images with your own eye. So it's, it's really, you get sharp, clean images, you get true color when you see it by eye. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, there's something really, I think, unique and special about that. And the purchase was supposed to happen, I guess, sooner than planned, but COVID kind of, I guess, slowed, as it did most things, it slowed everything down, right? Supply chains. Yeah, we, we really, I think that was one of the things that motivated us to reinvest in the observatory was we were like, what a great opportunity. People need to be outside more. You can social distance when you're out there. So what a great opportunity to run some events when we were unable to run events inside, mm -hmm. you know, what can we do to, to, to try to promote science when we can't go into the classroom and we can't do a lot of these things when we were on the, the, uh, the social distancing orders and those things. Unfortunately, it took about a year and a half <laughs> wow. for the, uh, the device to ship and get here. So it's a little bit after a lot of the mask mandates and those things. But yeah. um, we were able to get, I think, so far three sky viewings in and uh, so far this semester, in the fall semester, and we hope to get at least uh, three more in before the end of this semester. Of course, looking forward, it might be a little bit more, more chilly than earlier in the fall, but um, you know, honestly, when the weather gets cooler, 
We're down here in southeast Missouri. It's pretty humid, and that humidity actually is one of the worst parts uh -huh. of trying to get a clear image of something. If you kind of look at the summer um, uh, horizon, you'll see that sort of gray haze. It almost looks like clouds in the distance. Right. And that's all just the humidity. And so when things cool down and the ground cools down and the humidity drops, we can get actually much crisper and much clearer images of things in the night sky. Wow. Any plans to uh, make a permanent observatory again since the one at the farm is gone? Has that been talked about at all? There has been some, some rumblings about mm. a permanent observatory. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're looking at the finances and we've been reaching out to a few donors and so there's some yeah. talks and discussions and uh, we're really excited about that possibility moving forward. I think the college has now kind of highlighted this because of the, you know, we get so much res good response and positive response from the community, from the students when we do these events. I think there's a, a real serious consideration for trying to put a permanent observatory right here on campus. Because when you do these pop-up viewings, I mean, it's students come, but also, I mean, the community at large, if they're that are close to Cape yep. here. I mean, they're welcome to come too, right? Take, yep. a, take a look yep. at Saturn. The last, uh, the last event we had, I know there were at least three families with, with little kids and um, uh, that showed up, maybe four. And uh, we, you know, it, it was, for my part, I, I enjoy having the students come, but seeing, you know, a six, seven, eight-year-old see Saturn for the first time with their own eyes is also really, really beautiful. So we get a lot of uh, support from the community. A lot of people show up. I mean, you could be planting a seed for a future astronomer, right? We just don't know. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's one of the things is when it comes to science, you know, we see that, uh, you know, there's a lot of roadblocks for a lot of students whenever they're trying to get interested into science. Mm -hmm. At SEMO, we have a tremendous physics program. We've had a physics program for a long time. And these students, um, you know, they have to get started early. You right. gotta be well prepared in math. You gotta be well prepared in, in science and engineering. And so being able to plant that seed with, uh, with, with younger children is always a really wonderful opportunity yeah. for us uh, because it knows that we're just preparing the next round of physics majors at Southeast. That's great. Thanks very much for being here. Of course, thank you for having me. All right, Focus on Southeast is a collaboration of KRCU Public Radio and the Department of Mass Media here at Southeast Missouri State. Just a reminder that portions of these conversations will be broadcast on KRCU and will also be available online at krcu.org. From the Rust Center for Media, I'm Dan Woods. Thanks for watching and be sure to tune in next time when we focus on Southeast.